Welcome to this presentation on spinal cord diseases and trauma. My name is Dr. Anne Chauvet. I'm a boarded neurologist and neurosurgeon, and I have a love for hyperbaric medicine and canine rehab. Before we go on, I'd like to make sure you jot down my email, because at the end of this presentation, if you could take the time to email me three things you learned and three things you do not understand. And by mean you learned, I mean things that you did not remember from school or that are brand new to you. We also have a laminate for neurological emergencies and I would love to be able to pass it on to you so let me know if you'd like a copy. VCA Canada, Alta Vista Animal Hospital is the editor of this and I would like to make sure that they get recognized for this. Neuroanatomy leads you to your answer. So a little brief going back in time, back into your first year's vet school, we're going to try to make sense of the exam findings. So note a few things that simplify it. Ascending pathways are pathways that go to the brain. They're usually sensory. Descending pathways are pathways that leave the brain. And we're going to think usually motor. Some of the descending pathways are also going to be vestibular pathways and cerebellar pathways. Communication must happen between the limbs and the brain, and it all goes through the spinal cord. We label the tracks with a site of origin followed by their destination. So spinothalamic tract means it started in the spinal cord and it will end up in the thalamus. Some things to realize in the spinal cord. So here's a segment of cervical spinal cord. Top is sensory, bottom is motor, medial is pelvic limbs, slightly lateral to that is thoracic limbs. Of course, you're going to lose this part once you get thoracolumbar. That makes sense. So just a few things to remember. So when you think of an injury where it's located, not only in the segments of the spinal cord, but also within that segment of the spinal cord, which can be important for things like FCE. Pure reflex art are part of localization of spinal cord. So here we go. We've got sensory in the tendon, feeds back into the spinal cord, back down to the connecting neuron and to the muscle. At the same time, we've got an inhibition tracking down to the opposing muscle, so leading to relaxation in this case of the semi, while a contraction of the quads happen for the femoral nerve. And of course, we're talking about patellar reflex. A dog with no deep pain can still have reflexes. So for example, if my section of the spinal cord is here is affected, I can still have reflexes. So having reflexes does not mean there's voluntary. The loss of descending inhibition, so if I have an injury right here, inhibition is affected, the reflexes can be hyper or increased. Damage to the neuron in the cord, the neuron involved in the arc reflex is going to lead to lower motor neuron. So here's a good graphic thing to remember. C2 to C5, upper motor neuron to both sets of limbs. We have C6 to T2, upper motor neuron to the pelvic limbs, but lower motor neuron to thoracic limbs. We have T3, L3, which is upper motor neuron to the pelvic limbs. And of course, L4 to S3, which is lower motor neuron to the pelvic limbs. So here's a little table you can keep and kind of have a rough idea of what things will be like when you have to localize. The full neurological exam. Step one, get a fantastic history. So where did the problem start? Was it acute? Was it chronic? Did it progress or not? Is it worse after rest, exercise? Any response to medication or rest? Any pain noted by the owners? Any sides worse than the other? Front legs, back legs? Whatever you can get is super important. Is it waxing and waning or is it constantly there? The neuro exam in full is present at www.veterinaryneurology.net. For the purpose of this lecture, we'll skip cranial nerve because we're focusing on spinal cord. But we will talk about mentation and attitude because that needs to be normal. If you don't see a normal mentation, forget it, you're in the brain. Gait is super important. And you observe that at the same time as attitude and mentation. So we're going to go over all these things. Here's, for example, a typical wobbler dog. And I'm going to go over this. Here we go, take out the sound. This is a dog with a disc herniation, short and choppy front legs, very limited neck movement, nice arch back, and a wobbly or toxic pelvic limbs. Classic. We remember the Dobies, the Great Danes in the old days that used to have these malformed vertebrae, and that's where these were labeled for. So these are not actually wobblers, they're wobbler-like gait, so be careful with their terminology. This little guy came in with suspect of spinal cord problem, and certainly looking at it under its owner, you can see a general sway. Now, 
could be that all four legs are affected, but if you pay attention to its head, you'll see little tremors as well. Definitely inappropriate placing or position of the pelvic limbs, but you can see its head tremoring at times, so there's definitely a problem that's more central. So you have to be able to make these differences. Of course, if you're not sure, give me a buzz. I'll be right here. Let's take a look at this patient. Totally innocent dog is here to get assessed. So here's how you do good proprioception. You're going to go ahead and, if I can get this to work, um, straddle yourself right over the dog, who's totally bored, obviously. Place a hand in between the front legs so you can position the dog square and take away the vestibular input. Let the dog know you're coming and go ahead, grab the carpus and turn over at the carpus. Don't touch the toes, they don't like it. Good placing, right there. No withdrawal, perfect placing. Then we go ahead and switch hands and slide down to the carpus. Good placing, withdrawal doesn't count. Dog needs to reposition. You can see it's flinching in the back. Give it time, reposition. Here's the case of this one. This is pelvic limbs. Use your ankle not your back, I'm crouched down, my elbow is on my knee, hand between the pelvic limbs. Take a look at what's happening. Sliding down the leg, letting the dog know you're coming. And if you'll notice, I have a good yoga mat. I always look at these dogs or cats on a very good surface. Otherwise, you can have some weird inputs. Let's take a look at the thoracic limb reflexes. Biceps and triceps, so here's take a look at the biceps. Bicep is a flexor, so we're going to be looking at extending the tendon to get maximum stimulus. I'm putting some pressure behind the elbow, finger wrapped around the tendon, stimulating my finger and looking for contraction at the biceps, so an extension of the toes. Boom. Testing musculocutaneous nerve one more time. Then we're going to move to the tricep, which is a radial nerve, C8 to T1 mostly. It is an extensor, so we're going to flex the elbow. Here we go, moving right along, flexing the elbow, moving it a little bit forward, abducting it a little bit, using your proximeter hammer, and hitting the tendon on its insertion, looking for contraction of one of the bellies of the triceps. Moving on to the pelvic limb, L4 to L6 is the femoral nerve, and that's going to be taking care of the patellar reflex. In this case, I'm holding the up leg to distract the dog, who's a little nervous, then testing the up leg. Remember, old dogs can lose this reflex. Don't get excited if you don't see it in an old Labrador. And if they're tense, they may not respond to it. Moving along to the sciatic, L7 to S1. Now, if we're going to stimulate right over the hip, it does not count. Testing the biceps again, or the cranial tibial in this case. So I'm going to pause for a second. I want to show you this. Boom. So when you stimulate right over the hip, you're stimulating the nerve. When you stimulate right over the cranial tibial muscle, you're stimulating the nerve or the muscle itself. These are good tests when you're looking for neuromuscular, but they are not very useful when you're looking for spinal cord. They're not pure reflexes either. So if we go to the sciatic, we're going to have a flexure of the stifle extensor of the hock. So we're going to extend the stifle, flex the hock to give maximum tension to that gastroc tendon. And then we're going to tap it to look for a reflex in the semis or the gastroc tendon itself, which is quite beautiful in this dog. All right, cross extensor. This is a loss of inhibition. So there is a problem ahead, above, rostral, cranial to where this reflex arc is. So we've lost inhibition to the extensors on the opposing leg. Flex one leg with a little forceps there and you get extension. So cross extensor just means upper motor neuron. Transverse myelopathy. Myelopathy, spinal cord disease. Transverse means a few segments of spinal cord versus diffuse, which means a larger segment of spinal cord. Difference could be disc protrusion versus hemorrhage, for example. Partial means you still have deep pain and more. And complete means there is no deep pain. So complete transverse myelopathy, T3L3, means I have no deep pain in a dog that has a lesion between T3 and L3. That's bad news. Shift Sherrington, another one to know. Any lesion caudal to T2, 
can cause a lot of inhibition to thoracic limbs. And so this dog, is, when laying on its side, got overextension of the thoracic limbs. Position of pelvic limbs can vary. Not a prognostic indicator for recovery. All it means is that there's a lesion that is behind T2. How do you differentiate that from decerebrate and decerebrate? The dog's mentation is normal, and if you prop it up, it can walk on the thoracic limbs. So that means lesion is caudal to T2. All right, here we go. The progression of spinal cord disease. It can start anywhere, but it will progress. Paresis, weakness, ambulatory, with or without ataxia. Paresis, non-ambulatory. Plegic, no movement. Superficial pain present. Plegic, no voluntary movement, deep pain present. No deep pain. When you're here, you are racing against the clock. Ideally, you want to catch these dogs right in here. Paretic, beginning to not be ambulatory to non-ambulatory to get them to diagnostic and surgery fast. If we can catch them here, even better. But oftentimes, we have to struggle even to convince them in that zone. So let's review the tough one, the bladder. Voiding phase is a high resistance bladder with a low capacity. So we're looking at very good toned bladder. When you have an atonic bladder, you have a low motor neuron bladder. An autonomic bladder is an upper motor neuron bladder. So dyssynergia of the detrusors and urethra is what you have to consider. So let's look at the anatomy. The sympathetic bladder, which is L14 in dogs, L25 in cats, so there it is. And you've got a lesion a little bit high up. I would put it down here, but hey, we're going to go with it. So you've got at this point a relaxation of the detrusors and you've got a contraction of your throat sphincter. So you have a bladder that is relaxed. It is a filling phase, storage phase, low resistance bladder with high capacity. With S1 to S3 pudental nerve, the toned and striated muscle of the urethra, this is pudental nerve, also coming from S1 S3, will increase the tone in striated muscle in the urethra and that is also part of containing the bladder storage. When we go back, I'm sorry, we are missing a few things. There we go. So then we have our voiding phase, which is high resistant bladder and low capacity. This time we have S1 to S3 is affected. So we have lost that sphincter tone. And uh, usually we will have contraction as well, as you can see, of uh, the detrusors. And I will all allow for voiding. Voluntary micturition does need the cerebral input coming down here and going to the detrusor. That's a spinal reticular tract to the sacral nuclei. Pretty important. So there needs to be a voluntary knowledge. So you can tell. And the time that this comes back is usually at the time the patient gets voluntary movement back, this comes back. So the ability to control bladder and to know when it has to void is going to come back usually with voluntary motion. When you have an injury at S13, you have a flaccid bladder. Dribbling due to poor urethrostriated muscle tone, poor sphincter tone. Injury at L1 to L5 means dribbling due to poor sphincter tone as well. So you're not having a holding capacity and the bladder may not be flaccid. So recently I had a cat with problems at both um, the intumescence, normal intumescence, and as well with a compression at LS. So I had a very confusing bladder, but somehow we pulled through. Working up a spinal cord problem. The process is pretty simple. You've got spinal radiographs to take as well as thoracic radiograph. Do I often take spinal radiographs? Absolutely not. Um, I think they can be very challenging. Positioning is so super important and I'm glad to talk to you about that if you need to, but not this lecture. Blood pressure is important pre-anesthetic and in complete blood work to make sure there's nothing else interfering, that we're not missing anything pre-anesthesia. CT and MRI are golden standard. Pre MRI is preferred, sometimes not accessible. And of course, if you don't have either, then myelography still remains. Surgery will depend on the findings, spinal tap occasionally. Electrodiagnostics do have a role. So myelography here's the way it used to be done. You can see this is a small breed dog. Myelogram is done usually at L56 or L45, 56 small dogs, 45 large dogs by putting needles in lumbar area. And you follow through this contrast column and you look for any attenuation, or disruption in that flow of contrast. The challenge, as you can imagine, is that you're presented with a two-dimensional view. You have to pull your needle to do VD, so you better bet that you're there. CT and MR. So here's an example of CT with a myelogram. 
You don't always do a myelogram with CT, so a little dachshund with calcified disc usually get away with no myelogram. But if you don't have MRI, this is kind of what you have to do, right? Bone is pretty dense, and here's the soft tissue. Like a look at an MRI, you can see the blood vessels coming off the vertebrae, epidural fat, here epidural fat and CSF, T2 shows pathology better, T1 shows anatomy better, so in T2 I can see the hydrated discs that are noted right here, and in T1 I don't see the disc as well, but I can certainly see the muscles and the details a little bit better. By the way, these are sagittal views, sacrum, L7654. This is just a segment of the spine. So what are differentials? Well, damn it, that's what it is. The big fancy word, damn it. So we're looking at not only our history, our findings, the breed, the age, the onset, duration, symmetry, pain. And we're gonna come down with one of these. Disc herniation, disc disease, digital myelopathy, cyst malformation, spinal bifida, for example, neoplasia, infectious, immune-mediated, infarct, idiopathic, toxins, trauma. So, as far as metabolic, it doesn't show up there because really there's almost nothing metabolic that'll cause spinal cord issues. So you can take that one off. So disc disease, let's talk about it. Here's a dog that has clearly cervical pain. And not only that, but even has what we call a root signature. So it's holding that right front leg up. Extremely painful, unpleased dog. But you can see it can't use that leg very well. So this would be a dog that one can think maybe as osteosarcoma, maybe as another orthopedic lameness. Um, you have to go ahead and do your entire workup. You can see how difficult it was a dog for, for the dog to turn around and lay down, which is much more supportive of cervical. But typical gait for also an orthopedic disease, so you must make the difference. Cute little dog trying to recuperate post-surgery. You see hard back, and she's trying very hard. So here's an example of paraparesis, non-ambulatory yet. But trying very hard, you can see that little leg move, tiny little movement in the legs. That's a great improvement from having only deep pain pushed up. Here's a lion, so disc injuries happen to all kinds of creatures. And this is me putting the catheter in an awake lion. Sometimes we're crazy. Of course, you see a little dog that we saw earlier. Great example of a myelogram, attenuation of the contrast columns dorsal and ventral with deviation of the ventral column. And this is located over 13.1, narrowed intervertebral disc space. This is a disc herniation in a dog. So now you have to decide what side. Here's an example of an MRI showing that there has been compression, that has been chronic, and that compression has left, as in this dog, some damage within the spinal cord. This is a T2, so this could represent inflammation, infection. In the case of a compression, this can represent damage within the cord that can be irreversible, at least is what we think. Here's a great example of a CT. You can see a calcified disc, and in that CT, that disc is dense, a little bit more to this side, no Myelogram needed for this guy. And here's another example of an MRI this time. I need to get away from this. See what happens. We're going to stop him. So this um, MRI will show you that you have a disc that is very dense, that is slightly to the right side, right side being your left side, and compressing the spinal cord. Here's an example of a cat that presented to us with low motor neuron to the pelvic limbs. And that cat was very painful, plenty grade, and I think a great deal of difficulty ambulating overall. So we did a CT after we did our MRI that showed some moderate compression, certainly not enough to justify what we were finding. And as we go, we saw this misalignment of the, vertebra of the vertebrae, which is L7S1. You can see the gap, and we're going to go back. You can see the gap right here. And after adjustment, we repeated the CT, and voila, it's a nice big open 
spine. So don't always think it's a disc. Sometimes it can be chiropractic, so don't forget that. Degenerative myelopathy, another big one, right? German Shepherd dogs, insidious onset, slowly progressive, weeks to months to sometimes years. Boxers, lots of other breeds get it. Um, corgis get them, uh, Chesapeake's, Ridgebacks, and so on. It usually is a differential diagnosis that is obtained by rule out, so you have to get all the work up done, come back with nothing. You can certainly do a blood test in these dogs and send it to Missouri to test for their genetics. However, it's possible the test is inaccurate at times, and so you have to still do your workups and make sure you rule out everything else. The unfortunate thing is many of these old dogs and German Shepherd dogs have also some thoracolumbar disc that can cause a mild compression, so it can be very difficult to differentiate between the two. The pelvic limbs usually are worse first, but it definitely can affect the thoracic limbs and progress if wait long enough. Most of these dogs, unfortunately, are euthanized. Neoplasia is a perfect case, one of the more recent cases I've done before this lecture. And this is a hyper intense lesion right within the spinal cord, post contrast on T1. This is at C4 in a beautiful shepherd and this seven year old dog. So cancer is on the list four years and above. Progressive disease, in this case about eight months. Slow onset, but as aggravated by trauma. Differentials for tumors in the spinal cord, you have to think, and not necessarily this one on the picture, but you have to think hemangiosarcoma, adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, malignant peripheral nursery tumor, meningioma, and ependymoma is probably the rarer one of them all. Immune disease, tick-borne, GME, others. Let me introduce you to Miss Tooley, and here she is with her CSF top, so we'll talk about that. In this CSF tap, you will see a tremendous amount of white blood cells, which are purplish, under the hemocytometer. I should, on this hemocytometer, find no more than about three to five white blood cells. And clearly, we are having a lot. Now, Ms. Dooley did show up with severe cervical pain, hunched up, difficulty walking, some ataxia, and was then sent right away to her final tap after MRI. MRI was normal. And this is her literally after receiving a first blast of steroid, after waking up from anesthesia, enjoying the ride, rubbing, neck pain is gone. She also received hyperbaric medicine, hyperbaric oxygen therapy on recovery and was able to leave a hospital that same evening. Discospondylitis, we're talking pain, 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 pain. Radiographs on discospondylitis can be helpful. However, many of these patients will have been on anti-inflammatory drugs for a long time, so you can miss it. In this particular dog, it's very subtle to catch the infection right around here, unusual as well, and the loss of intervertebral disc space, the loss of detail, a little bit of punch hole right in this area. But chronic anti-inflammatories will ruin your radiographs and things can definitely lag behind. The dog can be painful from anywhere from four to six weeks before you see any radiographic findings. Here's a dog that presented to us with a total destruction of the LS area. And this is an older dog, 11 year old Labrador. And you can see tremendous proliferation of bone, destruction, ill-defined, disc protrusion. So somebody could look at this and say, ooh, there's a disc herniation, right? And I've got to find myself with this patient and operate it. This is the last thing you want to do. You do not want to operate this dog. You want to give them a chance to recuperate with antibiotics. You want to get blood cultures, urine cultures if you can. If you're good at it, you can go ahead and stick a needle right in there and get a culture from there. Or you can simply start them on antibiotic, number one being cephalexin, and rofoxacin is another one, the fluoroquinolones, and see what the response is. So that would be ideal. And uh, if they respond really well, fantastic, then you save yourself a ton of money. If they don't respond really well, then you're going to have to go and try to do an aspirate of the disc, blood culture, urine culture, and possibly even go to surgery. Here's a patient that's had trauma. This is an AA subluxation, and you can see tremendous pinching right at the atlantoaxial. And this is a dog that Chiquito. Here's a 
patient and had a severe head by car, overriding fractured vertebrae, transverse, pretty nasty. And here's one that had sacroiliac luxation. This should belong right here. And pelvic fractures. This is a domain that is shared between both neurosurgeons and surgeons, or just surgeons if you don't have a neurosurgeon, and it should be taken care of fairly rapidly. Of course, proper neurological exam will help not only in assessing current status, but status and recovery, as moving those bones can cause as much damage to the nerve roots and the spinal cord as the trauma itself did. So spinal cord trauma damage to the cord. You must understand what leads to trauma. Whether you're talking about hit by car, infarct, subluxation, or disc herniation. So there's a horse because I used to do equine as well in my old days. So severity of injury depends on a number of things. Depends on the degree of material compressing the cord, the rate at which it hit, and the duration, the amount of time that pressure has been there. Here's an example of a vertebrae that completely collapsed, compressed, and crushed the spinal cord. We have a few things to look at. We have dynamic injury. We have what we call concussion, and we have what we call laceration. So concussion is kind of like that beat up stuff. You know, you're beating it up. And laceration, you're kind of shearing it. And you have this sustained compression as well, which is it stays there, it doesn't go away. And it can continue to cause chronic injury and very some cases permanent injury. Immediate effects are conduction block, lack of information, axonal transection, damage to the actual nerve fiber, and microvascular disruption, which is crucial and will lead to severe edema. So here's an example of what can happen. You've got your zero hour trauma, and then 30 minutes later, this thing is spreading within two to four hours, and by 24 hours, you can have lost most of your function. Remember that the deep pain tracks are traveling all over the spinal cord. They're all over. And they are actually up in the white matter here. So in order to lead to no deep pain, you have to have a complete, complete myelopathy, as we called it earlier. So keep that in mind. So it's an emergency. Well, of course, spinal cord problems are always an emergency in my book, but some of them come more chronic, so we don't rush it. However, to me, they should be dealt with right away, of course. So what treatment do we have? In the case of actual acute trauma, you have to look at the cascade of things. And you can keep that, go back over it, ponder over it. But for the purpose of this lecture, all you have to know is you have a tremendous amount of permanent neurological deficit that can ensue if you do not act quickly. What is in your protection we need to do? Tons of studies out there. They used to be so happy they found methylprednisolone, sodium succinate, and that solumedrol, and of course solyeltocortef some people use. But the problem is that we're still not 100% sure that made a difference. The side effects of these drugs as well can be so deleterious that it led to the good, the bad fighting each other. So. We have to look at what is possibility. Right now in the literature, there's conversation that if you use it within four hours, preferably one hour, and the one dose initially could be useful. GM1 ganglioside, very new on the market, so to speak, of research, salicylic acid containing glycophospholipids. They're the major components of cell membranes in mammalian central nervous system. So there's a study that shows that studies that show accelerated recovery of motor function and bowel bladder function within the first three months post injury. Now remember, many of these are done on rats and mice in the lab or are done on human studies. So we don't have these prospective studies in our field because of the sheer number and honestly we don't keep good enough records to compile them all. And we should, we should really. Excited or neurotransmitter antagonists have been thought about. For example, an MDA receptor antagonist. They have a lot of them studies have shown that there is not really a long-term benefit. So that's those kind of went to the wayside. Other trial, erythropoietin, but it may lead to thrombosis. Nemodipine, the calcium channel blocker, has shown some benefit. One big one is minocycline. In a recent double-blind study, randomized control study, performed to assess the safety and dose optimization, it actually showed that with cervical spinal cord injury, patients were much better off in their score one year after injury. And again, that's human, right? So let's stick to the fact that this is not doggy related.
So the other part of this is neuroregeneration. The transplantation of embryonic stem cells, whoa, we all will talk about this all the time and it's so controversial, but it actually has shown to enhance remyelination, remyelination, sorry, and myelination and promote improvement of motor function. We have a number of other things such as chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan that have shown uh, to play a role in axonal regeneration. We have a number of brand new things that are coming out in the studies and you'll see, so I'm not going to hit you with all this. I want you to be aware that the work is constantly there and we don't really know. We don't really know which one is the best one right now. But what we do know is that when you have a trauma, rest is important, immobilization and rest. The rest should be a minimum of two weeks, and I say that arbitrarily because it sort of pushes the owner to be more attentive, and it depends on what the problem is. If you have a fracture, clearly those two weeks aren't enough. We're looking at four or six weeks. Let's evaluate in 24, 48 hours. As long as the patient improves, then you can keep going. If the patient does not improve, intolerable pain or worsen, then we need to go back to the drawing board, work up, and figure out what's going on. I'm still the, what I call an old school, so I still use steroids, about half meg per keg, ducks in size. But the bigger the dog, the less steroids I use. For example, if I have a 40 kilogram Rottweiler, I might use 10 milligrams of prednisone. And I'm using a very quick weaning cycle, usually three to five days, um, uh, twice a day, three to five days, once a day, three to five days, and then every other day. Or oh, sometimes I just use it perioptively for a couple of days and I stop. I don't really need a weaning period for that short uh, duration. But do they really help? I think they do. I do believe in my so, so subjective experience that the initial dose of steroids is helpful. I'm not sure that continuing steroids is tremendously helpful. This being said, it has been well shown that very low dose steroids on a chronic basis every other to every three days has promoted axonal regeneration. So that may be where it f fits for our dogs. Again, bigger dogs, those on surface area. Yeah. The controversy is Medicam or other non-steroidals. There's a huge wave right now of using these non-steroidals. I gotta say, I am skeptic. There's not much in the literature supporting switching to these. There's certainly a lot in the literature telling us the steroids are bad, but there's not enough in the literature for me to switch to non-steroidal. I gotta tell you, they have better pain management and the steroids are not good pain management. So steroids act directly, so they're gonna decrease your edema, so that'll create some pain management that will help with nerve root inflammation, but it won't directly work on pain receptors like the non-steroidals. So in that effect, Medicam perhaps is better. Again, I use steroids at such low doses and I'm not too worried about side effects versus the non-steroidals. I'm a little more concerned about those. That's a personal opinion, take it or leave it. Then we move on to the drugs that I use. So in a very acute spinal cord trauma, and I'm not talking about the routine disc surgery or anything like that, but as far as the acute spinal cord trauma that I see hit by car or the dog that I removed the massive tumor out of the spinal cord, then I will use mannitol, furosemide, and DMSO. I like the mannitol and furosemide combo for decreasing the swelling and intracellular and extracellular swelling from either damage directly to the dog or the damage that I've created in surgery. The DMSO is there as an oxygen free radical scavenger and the DEXSP is there for edema. I use one dose only. I don't usually continue it. If I do, it'll be on a very minute amount over time to just help your generation of axons. The big one that I'm into now, of course, being hyperbaric medicine person, is oxygen. I do believe the hyperbaric oxygen chamber is going to be the next wave for immediate trauma. Not always easy to get to, but it will help decrease the edema. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. There's a great deal of philosophies and backup information, um, validity into cooling the patient. So keeping them at 36, 37 degrees Celsius, minimizing metabolic rate should help decrease the damage to the spinal cord. Easier said than done, by all means. Immobilize, 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 cage rest. If it's not, 
you know, just a slip disc or something like that. Otherwise, it needs to be on a board if it's an actual physical trauma fractures. Uh, continue rest only if there's improvement. What about muscle relaxant? Well, I used to be big into that, and now I'm really careful, mostly when it's muscle spasm. In neck dog, so dog that has slip disc and neck, of course, love, love met methocarbamol or roboxin. It helps a lot with decreasing the spasm. And, of course, pain medication. We need to manage the pain. Great controversies. Is tramadol the right one? You all know that there's been a battle with tramadol maybe not being the great pain med it's supposed to be. And let's take a look at what we mean for pain medication. I mean, in cats, I love amantadine and gabapentin is pretty good. Even though gabapentin has become kind of this big gun for pain management, we're still not 100% sure how much it helps. So it's kind of a bit of a struggle. For cats, buprenorphine and amantadine are kind of the ticket. And for dogs, I sometimes like butophenol. Uh, you can't mix it with the opioid, but the other one, of course, is using gabapentin. If you're using Medicam non steroidals, then that may definitely be an extra help. So, where does the pain come from? The pain and the spinal cord come from multiple places in the spine, sorry, not just spinal cord. So the first one is radicular pain, nerve root pain. Of course, it hurts, pinch nerves. The second one is disc pain, discogenic pain. It hurts. The next one is meningeal pain. Wrapping of the spinal cord is super painful. And the next one is periosteal pain or bone pain. One thing is for sure, there are no pain nerve endings inside the spinal cord. So that is not painful. And let's not forget muscular pain. So hurting in the muscles from either spasms or direct injury is important to remember. So five things to protect for. So case example, quick one. Remember that little chiquito I showed you this AA problem? Here's the dent causing a push on the spinal cord. We have hyperintensity in the cord, so some damage in the cord. Went ahead and strapped him down with some makeshift splint, and that worked beautifully for him. Uh, made some very different splints from now on, and that worked much better. That bit of a cushion wrap around the neck. And since I've been doing this, I've never had to cut one or do stabilization. Again, these dogs are not going to be athletes anymore. Um, as far even if they get a surgical stabilization, it doesn't mean they'll be able to run about and jump fences again. Here's one that maybe, maybe he's not going to walk ever again. So this is a hit by car, most likely. This is an overriding fracture of a vertebrae over another one. Spinal cord travel goes this way. Chances are there's no deep pain. And in a case like this, if there's no deep pain, there's not going to be any recovery. Now remember, this being present, T13R1, reflexes are still intact in the pelvic limbs. So you could have a dog that actually has patellar, gastroc, with jaw, but doesn't feel anything. So when you pinch the toes, look for a cranial awareness of the pain. Compression fracture, this can happen with trauma or with cancers. If you see this on a radiograph, it's not very good news. This being said, if it's due to a trauma, you can go ahead and decompress, we'll go back, and go ahead and stabilize. If it's due to a tumor, then you can still decompress for comfort, stabilize, wait for your biopsy, and decide from there, maybe radiation therapy or other procedures can be considered. An actual fracture can be stabilized in a number of ways, plates, luber plates, pins, stapling, here's external fixators that have been used in this LS overriding fracture, many options. So recovery from surgery, well, cage rest, minimum two weeks, of course, if it's a fracture, probably four, six, eight weeks, and evaluate 24 to 48 hours, continue rest only if there's improvement. Steroids should be about a half milligram per kilogram, twice a day, winning cycle. Again, remember, we do per meter square with the larger dogs, non-steroidals. Again, flip of the coin, what do you like to use? I'm a steroid person. Some people prefer to use non-steroidals. I think the evidence is still not well proven for not using steroids or using non-steroidals, but I also can't negate the fact that non-steroidals will bring better pain management. Muscle relaxants, if necessary, pain medication. Manage urinary and fecal function as well. One of the things is, for dogs, for example, that have neck 
pain because of disc herniation after we do surgery, it's very rare that they need anything more but muscle relaxant at a very low dose of prednisone. Prednisone for inflammation of nerve roots and muscle relaxant for the muscle spasm that can hurt for a few days after surgery. So here's a perfect example of cage rest. Two dogs in their cages. Actually, one of those was cardiac. You can tell from the lead. And this is a dog that obviously is super uncomfortable, not, and enjoying his little cage. We want to make sure you manage the bladder. You want to have urinary catheters or whatever is needed. And yes, you can send them home if you have to. Keep the dog clean, well managed. Rehabilitation probably should be started early. Again, back to my equine days. Here's a good example of what you have to do with horses, a little harder to rehab. And here's a dog that in the old days at University of Wisconsin, we used to have this tub. We're able to rehab this dog in the tub. Of course, these things have changed. We also have things like laser therapy we use a lot, not with cancer patients, but we can definitely use laser therapy. This is my laser and it shows you uh, we can go as high as 30 watts. No, it's not going to burn the dog. Um, and we can effectively diminish pain, inflammation, and promote healing. Here's, of course, underwater treadmill, in this case, a cat. And uh, excessive shaving, you can tell. Just kidding, he was matted. And uh, we want to see that underwater treadmills and full rehab facilities have gone above and beyond now and are so common and very important for the well being of our patients. Here's Miss Ola, post-surgery. Even lions need rehabilitation. Here's a surgery site for type 1 herniated disc calcified. And she's just coming out of her water. She hates the water like all lions, but we had a pool donated for her. And that was a real ticket for her to get up and walk. And here's me trying to pet her and comfort her. Quite crazy days. We have as well at Alta Vista a DVD if you need for your patient that goes over canine rehab after spinal cord or back uh, surgery and uh, spinal cord injury so don't hesitate to reach out we'll be happy to send you a copy and you can use that for your patient so your patient can get it straight from us not a problem it is quite detailed so here's our hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber this is my new baby it's actually my office and we're super excited to have this it's a state of the art it's uh, booming and being quite promoted across the world for human care and still limited in what it can be used for we are learning a lot about hyperbaric chamber in the human field and as well in the canine not so many chambers in the world for animals but we are slowly and surely putting data together and trying to come up with some studies probably retrospective and prospective um, the purpose of the hyperbaric chamber is to decrease edema and so it acts as a vasoconstrictor under pressure we are putting these patients in this little middle submarine and we're pressurizing with pure oxygen to about 10 meters underwater and this is going to distribute oxygen beyond the carrying capacity of the red blood cells dilute it right into the plasma and go ahead and to the tissue directly so penetrating areas that blood vessels cannot reach and normally oxygen could not be delivered the importance of that is helping with inflammation and providing oxygen that is ever so important to those white cells that are fighting inflammation as well, it counteracts oxygen free radical damage, amazingly so, because we think oxygen is going to make more free radicals, but it doesn't. It actually acts against the process of free radical damage. So very simplified, of course, but the patients go in awake, no sedation. They're either one large dog or two small patients, and the treatment is roughly 50 minutes, 10 minutes to descend to start the dive, and about 30 minutes to 40 minutes under pressure at about 10 meters or 2 ATH, and again, surface back for about 10 minutes. Very non-invasive, and they feel phenomenal after it. And it found a lot of improvement. My patients post up feel better, look better, heal faster, go home sooner, and that is the ticket for me. And of course, if none of what we do works, then we always have the carts, whether it's for cats or for dogs, these canine carts can be super useful. So we shouldn't really be giving up. Monitor bladder and fecal control and manage these animals carefully. 
So thank you very much for listening. I'm sure you have a ton of questions. I have tried to condense this in 45 minutes. There's no way I can cover spinal cord all entirety in one hour, but I've tried my best. So just remember, Sadiq Shibahi said, a rock pile ceases to be a rock pile the moment a single man contemplates it, bearing within him the image of a cathedral. So anything is possible. Thank you very much for joining me. Please don't hesitate to email me or you can call me at Alta Vista Animal Hospital at 613-731-6851. Thank you so much and you have a fabulous day.